On Saturday, September 12, 1987, a 50 year old security guard and maintenance man would arrive at the Corning Glass Works plant to work his usual overnight shift. But when his replacement arrived the next morning to relieve him, he was nowhere to be found. Security tapes would reveal a shocking crime, the theft of a quarter of a million dollars of platinum. But they would also raise questions. Was the missing man an innocent victim or was he an accomplice to a brazen heist? This is one minute and 43 seconds and this is the story of Dale Kerstetter. All right. Hello. Welcome to Hi. One Minute. Welcome to <laughs> I'm sorry that was not that hello wasn't for me. I might keep that in there. Welcome to okay. to 1 minute and 43 seconds. What are we, Elaine? Uh, a true unsolved mysteries podcast. Thank you. You got it. <laughs> so uh as you can all tell my guest today is the wonderful Elaine Erickson. She's been on a few times before. We've talked about some great uh, mysteries together. And I am grateful enough to have Elaine back. So welcome back, Elaine. Thank you. I'm very excited to be back. Great. Yes, we have a good case today. Before I get into that, however, I want to make note of the fact that I have not done an episode in a long time. I think the last time I released something was in April. So I've been really bad with um, keeping up with the episodes. Uh, it's been kind of a turbulent year. There have been a few highs and then some pretty significant lows, as Elaine knows. So the, the good thing was I got to go to London for the first time. Yeah, that must have been awesome. And one of our cases that we talked about took place in London. That was the one with uh, Andrew Gosden. Gosden. Yes, that was a really interesting one. And they did. They arrested a couple people in connection with it, or, or they spoke to some people about it. I haven't heard I any updates. Because that. that was only a couple weeks after we did it, didn't we? Wasn't it? Yeah, and I like to think we had a part in it. No, I'm kidding. We didn't probably at all. Did you run into Andrew Gosden while you were in London? Uh, no, I did not. I No, I did not. If I did so, it would have been unknowingly. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, all it says is the last news is um, that two men were arrested for trafficking and kidnapping, and they were questioning them in connection with Andrew. So I haven't heard any updates on it, but. I wonder if that resulted in anything. You know, I don't know. Yeah. It's possible we'll they know more. Yeah. It's possible they know more. more come out. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, so when I got back from London, I got COVID for the first time. So that was no fun. Um, but thankfully I recovered from that. And then probably the worst thing of all, uh, my father passed away a couple months ago. Um, and I, yeah, I'll keep that short. I just wanted to kind of let people know it's what's been going on in my life and why I've been kind of out of, <laughs> out of touch. But the podcast is, is really important to me. And I know my father always listened to it. He was always one of my listeners. So I will continue to do it. And the good news is I think... I'm going to strive to have uh, more regular episodes going forward. So um, thank you, Elaine, again, for being on with me for my return episode. Of course. I'm excited to be back with you and back with all of your listeners. Yes. All right. So, Elaine, should we get into this case that I got for you? Yes, please. I'm very curious. Enough of the chatter, you say. Let's get back into it. Or let's get into it. Stop wasting time. Come on. <laughs> okay. So the case I have today is a missing persons case, but it's actually not 
your typical missing persons case. It's got kind of a twist to it because oh. there is some question about whether or not the person who disappeared was a accomplice to a crime or whether or not he was an innocent victim hmm. of foul play. Okay. So, yeah, this is a great one. Uh, the, this one I first uh, heard about, I think, either on Reddit, Unresolved Mysteries, but it was also covered on Unsolved Mysteries. Do you remember watching Unsolved Mysteries with Robert Stack? Yes. And you know what? I just found it streaming. What is it streaming on? Something. One of the streaming services I have, I just found it and I watched it like a week ago. I restarted it. Oh, awesome. Yeah, it's good. I forget which one it's on, too, but I think we have it. And it's... Uh, Man, Robert Stack was the man, so. Oh, yeah. Anyway. I'm going to look it up now. Not um, that it's important. No, it's all right. And uh, It's on seen... Peacock, actually. Okay. And Amazon Prime. Yes. Okay, that sounds oh. right. Um, for so our you... listeners, I do not work for either of those streaming services, but you can find them there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Elaine. <laughs> all right. So the person we're going to talk to, or talk about, not talk to, um, is Dale Kerstetter. And at the time of his disappearance, he was 50 years old. So um, if he were alive today, that would make him what? If he disappeared in 1987, he would have been oh, 85. Yeah. Yes, Dale Kerstetter. So our story takes place in... Uh, Bradford, Pennsylvania. Uh, okay. He grew up in Bradford, except for a little bit of time he spent in the Air Force. He spent most of his life in Bradford, Pennsylvania. Okay. Is so, Bradford a large town, small town? No. No, actually, when I looked it up, it, it looked incredibly small. Okay. Oh, Population yeah. 8,000. As yeah. of two years ago. So not incredibly small. But pretty small. <laughs> pretty small. Um, so he actually had, I think he had six kids. I think he had like five daughters and one son. And at the time of his disappearance, he, his son was still living it with him. Four of his five daughters lived in the Pennsylvania area. So uh, his kids said he was a great dad, um, that he loved to have fun. He loved to be outdoors, just that he was a good person. And his mother in particular said he never liked to lie. He, he didn't feel good about lying. And I just thought that was an interesting, interesting tidbit about Dale. Okay. Yeah. So he was divorced by the way, um, at the time he had been divorced for 10 years, uh, at the time of his disappearance in 1987. Okay. Dale worked at Corning Glassworks plant, which they make, I don't know anything about this, but apparently they make glass rods for electrical resistors. And hmm. part of that process requires platinum, which is one of the most precious commodities in the world. Okay. And it's Got it. worth a lot of money and it's used a lot in jewelry, but it's also used in manufacturing, which is the business that, that Dale was a part of. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and get into the disappearance. So yes. Dale was actually a maintenance man uh, at the, the plant, but he also at the time of his disappearance, he had recently started to be a uh, security guard and he worked the overnight shift. Okay, so he will vanish during his shift, his overnight shift. So everything started out pretty normally, as it always tends to do. I'm going to go over first just the events of the night as they were known by the next day. And then we'll get into a little more information. So it was September 12th, 1987, and he showed up for his shift at 1030 p.m. as he usually did as an overnight security guard. He relieved the guard that was there. The next morning, John Lindquist, who was the guard that was supposed to replace him, came into the 
the plant and found the seat that Dale usually sat in to be empty. So this is 7 a.m. So this guy, John, this guy, John starts kind of looking around and goes and in like, uh, I think they had like a little cafeteria or something where people would eat and stuff. He went in there and he saw the newspaper sitting there with Dale's lunch pail. So he happens to pick up the newspaper and sees Dale's keys for the plant, I believe, underneath the newspaper. And then he looks inside the lunch pail and all of the food was still in there. It had been, it hadn't been eaten. Okay. So it was almost as if he was interrupted while he was about to eat or something. Mm-hmm. Yes. The shift that he was working was a Saturday night and on Sunday morning is when they found this. So they also found um, Dale's pickup truck or yeah, pickup truck in the parking lot and the weird thing is that the keys were in the ignition. There was a full carton of cigarettes and he was a heavy smoker. And there was an empty gun holster for a 22 caliber pistol. Oh, okay. So they called the police to kind of take a look at the scene. And it was also discovered that Dale was supposed to check in with the main factory at the, of the plant um, every hour because part of his job as a, a security guard was to like walk the premises and um, like check certain areas, I guess. But he yeah. never, he, he, when he did his rounds, he never like checked in with the main plant. He didn't check in ever? No. He didn't do like the 1131? No. Which, and I don't, I feel like that would have been a red flag if I'm the, at the main factory. Yeah. Yeah. They just sat around and waited until 7 a.m. to wonder why he wasn't responding. You know, I I really don't know what happened. I don't know what happened there. I don't know if it was like an absolute, Mm -hmm. um, like it was an absolute necessity. They had to check in every hour or if it didn't happen sometimes. And that was kind of a you know, people kind of weren't as adhered to the rules, but yeah, this is just something that it says police learned the next day is that he was supposed to, but he didn't. Okay. So they didn't, they didn't waste a lot of time on this on Sunday afternoon. Again, this is the day after Dale disappeared. uh, The sheriff's brought in the canine unit to see if they could like find Dale somewhere in the plant because it was a huge, uh, huge plant. It was 112 square feet or I'm sorry, 112,000 square feet. Um, that makes more sense. So they thought, you know, what if he was doing his rounds and he like had a heart attack or some kind of medical event and he's like laying somewhere within the plant. Okay. Or, you know, injury, too. I mean, it's a dangerous, it's kind of a dangerous job because you're around a lot of dangerous things. Um, Because there's like a glass glass kiln that everybody calls the tank. So this is where things start to get pretty interesting. So the dogs kind of tracked Dale around his normal route. Mm -hmm. So, but then... The dogs led investigators to the second floor, and that's where this glass kiln was. And how, how big is this glass kiln? I don't know. I imagine pretty big. If they're manufacturing a lot of glass rods, I assume they have to melt down a lot of glass. Correct. I don't know. I'm just totally guessing. This tank contained the platinum, right? Mm-hmm. And it was not normally it was not normally on Dale's security rounds. Oh. And his scent was found at the tank, but they did mm-hmm. not find him anywhere in the building, okay? Mm-hmm. They searched apparently this plant was near some woods. And so they searched the the creek that was there and the woods, and no trace of him was found. Mm-hmm. Are you ready for the uh Next crazy part? 
Yep, I'm ready. Elaine's like, that's why I'm here doing the podcast. Get on with it, Megan. <laughs> they decided to check uh, security tapes. All right. And oh, this is where, yeah, of course. This is where some, uh, some stuff was revealed. Okay. So oh. Dale's shift started at 10 30. If you remember, he arrived at the plant at 10 30. Yeah. Okay. Um, the first thing that they saw on these security tapes is a masked intruder walking, oh. in, walking into the guards area in the back of the plant. So I guess this is where the guards would come in, the security guards. I, I'm not sure. And this was around 1040. So this is 10 minutes after Dale relieved the prior security guard. Wow. That was quick. So this personnel manager, Patrick Foley, is the one that's viewing the tapes. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so 10 minutes after Dale relieved the prior security guard is when they see this intruder on the tape. And when he saw it, the personnel manager, Foley, was very like alarmed by what he saw. Of course, mm -hmm. because there's a masked yeah. intruder. The first thing I saw was a masked man in the back of the plant in the one area. When I saw the masked man on a tape, I was very alarmed. At first I thought, well, obviously this person, there's been some, some foul play, Dale's involved in foul play, and he, and he probably is missing. At 10.45, five minutes after this, the footage shows Dale coming in and meeting the intruder in the core, in like a oh. corridor in the back, in the back of the plant. And then it shows the two of them walking together. And then okay. Dale's, Dale is not seen at all again after that. But a minute later, oh. a minute later, the intruder was seen walking alone. Okay. Okay. So they continue to watch these tapes. Okay. And the intruder goes up to the tank, the platinum tank around midnight. Okay. Okay. So that's, you know, a little over an hour after this whole thing, this exchange between Dale and the unknown person. Yeah. And then as I continued to review the tapes and I saw the masked person come back out and go up to the tank area, then I was extremely anxious because at that time I realized that not only did we have a missing employee, we also, there was a good possibility that we had missing platinum in the plant. Yeah, so it was several pieces that were missing and they were cut out with a hacksaw. Oh. Again, I don't know how this stuff works, but apparently you need a hacksaw to get it out. I don't know, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. According to this guy fully, apparently the way this person was acting, they seemed incredibly familiar with like the layout of the plant. Whoever removed the platinum from the tank was extremely familiar with the plant, everything in the plant, they knew exactly where to go. You have to remember that this transpired late at night. There were very few lights on in the plant, but yet this person knew exactly where to go, where to find bags that they needed, tools that they needed, how to go up to the tank and move back out of the tank area. Yeah, my first thought is, did they interview the guy that this man relieved? So the one who was on the earlier shift. That's a good question, and I don't know the answer. I, I haven't seen a lot about him other than his name was, like, Art, I think. Or sick. I mean, that seems like an easy person to jump to, but sometimes it is the most obvious. You think it would be him? Maybe. I mean, they got there so quickly. Obviously, the other option would be someone was just sitting there waiting until the shift changed for some reason. But yeah. the intruder showed up very quickly. And I don't know, like, if it seems like they knew their way around this place pretty well, I would think that, you know, they had been there before and it is likely that it would be a prior employee. That's a good observation, also, yeah. If it was the guy who worked right before this man, then uh, maybe he came back. And, oh, never mind. Nope. This is a bad theory. No, you, you know what? That's what we do on one minute and 43 seconds. We speculate. But that's before, true. No, I go ahead. I was going to say, but before we go there, um, let me tell you just a little more about what was on the surveillance because I yeah, feel like it going. might it might shape your opinion. 
So I'm getting ahead of myself. Go ahead. No, that's okay. The So this is what is kind of the creepiest or um, confusing slash chilling. I would say chilling things. Oh, okay. Um, and it, it goes back to the interaction between Dale and the intruder when they're shown walking together. Um, because at one point, as they're walking together, Dale looks directly into the camera. Oh. Did you just get, I just got chills when I said that. Oh. So. Yeah. The main question in this case is, is Dale being threatened? Is he being coerced into doing this? Or does he know the intruder? And they hashed out this plan together. I and mean, the fact that he why. looked right into the camera does make me think that he was trying to send a message. Well, you know? let me tell you. Let me tell you this. So, um, alternatively, this guy Foley, who's like the personnel manager. Yeah, he thinks he speculates. Maybe Dale did everything in front of the camera to flaunt his involvement in the crime as in like, mm -hmm. Hey, screw you. I'm screwing you over and I'm taking all your platinum. What are you going to do? Interesting. So the personnel manager, was that his job title fully? I believe so. He, he thinks that this was intentional, that he's guilty. He, I, that's the sense I get. There's another apparently personnel manager. This is interesting and it's relevant to this part. C. Dale Perry, I guess I'll just call him Perry. Um, yeah. He said he said that um, Dale was quote a marginal employee, hmm. which is not the most uh, glowing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not the most no. glowing description of somebody who works for you. <laughs> so I'd be a little unhappy if that was on my personnel report. <laughs> Yeah, and, and so the, he said that Dale was a slow worker and that they did have some problems with him occasionally. And I don't know if those problems revolved around him being slow or what, um, but that is what this guy, Perry, says. Interesting. Okay. But there was an instance that they recalled several years ago that um, Dale essentially saved like risked his life to stop an accident from happening, so. Dale was a uh, uh, marginal employee. Yeah, he was a slow worker, and yeah, we had some problems with him occasionally, but at the same time, we're looking at an employee who, uh, at the risk of his own life, probably saved half a dozen lives and hundreds of thousands of dollars of property value. We had an incident uh, several years ago where a uh, forklift that accidentally rolled underneath a uh, stream of hot molten glass and the glass was actually pouring down onto the propane tank in the back of the uh, forklift. Dale immediately jumped onto the forklift and drove it out from underneath the hot stream of glass. Wow. And for them to call him a marginal employee after he did that. I know. Give my man a raise. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's Although actually... he did have plans to eventually rob the place of their platinum, then he would want to rescue the plant. Hmm. Well, this was several years before this. It yeah, just says a plan, several. A plan like that to eventually steal the platinum and, you know, have an accomplice and everything. I think you'd want to take several years to plan it. To make sure I it guess so. Flawlessly. Kind of like an office space situation. You're kind of just like, yeah. I can't wait to take all the money from these bastards. Yeah. <laughs> And you know what? Yeah. What? There is uh, some evidence that could point to the fact that he may have been angry at his place of work. Um, so we could talk about that. So according to this guy Foley, he's the other personnel manager, mm -hmm. this Corning Glassworks plant actually downsized and a lot of people lost their jobs. Okay. Yeah. Dale did not lose his job, but he was cut out of the trade shop. So he got like a $5,000 pay cut. Oh, 
That's facts. So this was, I'm not sure how, it just says prior to his disappearance, but I'm not sure how long before. Mm -hmm. um, so he was actually working like as a, you know, maintenance and um, I guess a, a trade worker. I'm not sure exactly what that entails, but obviously if he's like jumping on forklifts and driving them around, it's still, he's heavily involved in the process. Yeah. Anyway, he actually took up the job as the overnight security guard um, to make up for his lost money. Oh, okay. According to Foley, he was not a happy person at the time of the theft. Oh. So I'm not sure how they were able to gather that. There's a lot of people that go to work unhappy, you know. Yeah. They just want their paycheck and which yeah. is understandable. I would say most people are not super happy about having to go to work. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's most, but certainly a lot of people are not happy about having to go to work. But there, so there is, there's things that suggest that he could have done this. Mm -hmm. um, but also his family, his daughters believe he's an innocent victim. And they right. believe, they believe this because this is kind of chilling as well. Uh, one of the cameras showed the intruder wheeling a very heavy bag from a side room uh, on a forklift at around just before one in the morning. Oh no. So it could have changed. It could have been that this was the platinum, but it also could have contained Dale's body. If, yeah. if Dale was an innocent victim. So Dale, just to go back a little bit, yeah, Dale was do. seen going down the corridor and that was the last time he was seen on the security cameras. Correct. He was seen with the the intruder. Yeah. They were they were talking to each other. And then they okay. walk they walk down the corridor. Dale looks directly at the camera. And then that's the last time he's seen on surveillance. Okay. But they have so the intruder to, later. Yeah, he has to be able to get out of the building somehow. So I would right. have to think his either his live body or his dead body are in that bag, is in that bag. Well, then they um, also, so yeah, that's another thing to note. And that that's true too, that the dog, the dogs hit on where the, that's weird because they saw the intruder go upstairs, right? And take, mm -hmm. they saw him taking the platinum. Yeah. But they didn't find, I, it, I am unclear if the dogs found his scent, like, leaving. Hmm. But that's another yeah. question I have, because the camera shows an intruder, The it shows the intruder, the unknown person, taking the platinum. But the dogs detected Dale's scent on the, like, the glass tank. Oh. Or whatever it's called. I wonder how reliable that is. Dogs True. tracking a scent. What is yeah. the success rate there? The other so, thing that could be is that if he was an accomplice, they went somewhere where there were no cameras. Um, Dale got into this guy's outfit and put on his mask and when carried out the crime. That's true. I don't know where but, the intruder is. Yeah, exactly. But if you're going to do that, why not just like, yeah, I was going to say, if you're going to do that, why not just bring a mask and whatever else and then just do it yourself? But having a person there makes it look like he, like Dale wasn't the one to do it. Right. Or so, Dale... And this other guy planned this robbery together. Yes. Um, but once the mass intruder arrived, Dale planned to maybe, this is pure speculation out of nothing, but he could have planned to kill that guy or get him out of the picture so that he could have all the platinum to himself. But if the camera shows 
this masked person taking the platinum, it still looks as though Dale is innocent, even though that was him taking the platinum. I'm glad you said that because that is, that's, yes, that's a possibility. Also, the other way around. Maybe they both planned it and then the intruder killed Dale to yes. keep the platinum to himself. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I think that Dale's family probably know him fairly well, I would think. Um, and if they are seeing him as innocent, I don't know. You'd have to be a very manipulative and very intelligent person to be able to plan a heist like that and frame someone else. You're right. So basically, this is what Dale's family thinks. They think Dale arrives to the plant for his shift mm -hmm. and he heard the masked intruder or saw him like on surveillance and then went to investigate. Yeah. And that's the, um, that's the conversation that took place where he goes back to that corridor and sees them talking. Uh huh. Now, that conversation... In, maybe instead of, hey, you know, expecting this person to be there because they're planning something, that's a possibility. Maybe that he didn't know who this person was and had said, hey, you know, what's like, he was confused questioning the guy. And maybe the guy says, do what I say. I have a gun, you know, and Dale, knowing there's cameras in there, like obeys this guy's orders and... Yeah. They walk next to the camera. He looks at the camera, maybe as a signal that this is, I'm being, I'm being threatened. I'm under mm -hmm. duress. Mm -hmm. So that's what, that's what his family believes because they say that his mom in particular says, if he was involved in this, he was out of his mind because it wouldn't be something that he would do. I suppose no one thinks that their loved one would do something like that. Another important note to make is that Dale was $30,000 to $40,000 in debt. Oh. So he lived in a, well, well, hold on, hold on. Okay. He lived in like a trailer, I guess, at the time. Okay. Of. But yeah, so he, he was behind on his bills and he was in debt. Um. But his family kind of says, debt. like if he's just paying off, you know, paying off his trailer or something, trailer most and people vehicle. are in some kind of debt. You know, most people are still paying a car bill and a like a home mortgage or something or rent. Right. And I all how it says, serious his debt was. All it says is that he was in debt on various payments, including trailer and vehicle payments. But then it also says different bills, which he owed throughout the area. Hmm. But, okay. but his family says his children were financially well off and could have easily taken care of. And that he had a 401k. He had stock in Corning and that um, he had $5,000 in his account. And uh, her da his daughter said if he ever got desperate enough, he needed money instead of doing something highly illegal like this, he would have just come to them. Now, is that a family member being naive? Or is it like you said, they know him the best and... Yeah, I don't know. That it sounds like... Call. It sounds like his employers think he did it. Hmm. They think that if he didn't plan it himself, that... He definitely had somebody help him, and he was definitely involved somehow. I wonder, because how well could, can his employers really know him? Right. Especially currently, or at the time of this crime, he was the night guard. You know, they're not hanging out with him or seeing him. During that time, how well can they know him as a person? Well, he did work there from he did work there for thirty. Or excuse me, twenty seven years. So I mean, they had to know yeah, him on some yeah. level. True. His best friend, a guy named Bob Hartle, does is on the team that he doesn't believe that Dale did this, 
And he says that they spent a lot of time together. They went on hunting trips because Dale liked to hunt. And uh, Dale never mentioned anything about wanting to rip off the company or he never mentioned okay. anything about the thefts. And his friend thinks that if he were planning this, that he would have said something to him or at least like made some sort of slip up. Mm -hmm. Well, and his, like your coworkers that you work directly next to, I think know you a lot better than your superiors. Right. Um, and your best friend. Yeah. In absolutely. my experience, like my supervisors don't know me as well as the person that I'm working next to every single day. So I am more likely to believe his family and his friend than I am the managers. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you there. I mean, it could have been that he was angry at the company. I mean, annoyed that he like got downsized or he got a pay cut. But I mean, something like this is a huge leap from that. Cause how many people go to work and they're like, they're pissed off because they, because of something at work. I mean, it's no, pretty normal. Right. Oh yeah. Another, yeah, they don't pull off giant crimes. Another uh, aspect of this, if he did do this, let's say he was involved. Is yeah. he alive today? Yeah. Why is his gun missing? Is he alive and where? And why is his gun missing? Yeah, so, okay. Let's backtrack again. So his keys were in his truck. In the ignition. In the ignition. Yep. Okay, this is, this is small town Pennsylvania. So maybe this is something that is considered more normal or safe to leave keys in the ignition. I know that's something that really? people in very small towns do. Really? Yeah, I've heard of that. Like very small towns. Like 1,000 people and under. I don't know. I can't really speak to this town, but... You that's know, interesting. I've never heard of that. Safe place. Um, I get the sense that it but, wasn't... It wasn't... I get... If they're mentioning it, I get the sense that it wasn't typical. Just because... Well, maybe, I mean, the police don't know. Anyway, go ahead, please. You were, finish your thought. So the other thing though, is that he had down in the cafeteria, his lunch was down there, right? With the newspaper and his keys. Um, I mean, I'm assuming that's what he was planning on eating on his lunch break. Right. So it's super weird that all of this happened 10 minutes after his shift started. So when did he have time to go and start his lunch break and read a newspaper? Oh. Why is his stuff down there? Yes. That is super odd to me because... That's a good point. I didn't think of that, Elaine. Yeah, that's what I can't wrap my head around. I mean, that's just one piece of it. You know, if he supposedly... He either disappeared or he was in the middle of conducting this robbery or he had just, you know, or there was an intruder and he was still startled by whatever happened. You know, there's a lot of scenarios that might have happened, which does not lead to him going down and deciding to take his lunch break. Yeah, that's a good point. And you know what? I'm wondering about the missing time here or not. I mean, so 10.45 a.m., or excuse me, PM, when Dale goes in and meets the intruder, they briefly talk to each other and then they walk back and then that's the last time, right? Yeah. So it's not until just before midnight that this intruder goes up to get the platinum from the plant. What happened between 10, uh, you know, let's say they talk for a few minutes. It had to have been before 11 that they're on these it's, you know, around 1045, 1050. Yeah. What happened in the hour between he arrives at the plant and then he goes up to the, the second floor to get the platinum? Yeah. Could it have been something? Now, just hear me out. I don't, I don't know about how, the likelihood of this because he was a, secure, a security guard. But what are the yeah. chances the guy, the intruder came in and said some BS story about who he was or why he was there. Like, mm -hmm. oh, I just came, you know, to 
you know, I'm so-and-so from whatever other plant. And I just came to do something work related. And so Dale was sure, like, yeah. and Dale was like, oh, okay, come on in. But then again, yeah. he's wearing a mask. He's wearing a mask. That's and Dale's suspicious. a security guard. I mean, is he's not going to buy that, is he? If his job is literally, he knows who's supposed to be in there and who's not. Yeah, yeah. So, I, okay, I'm guessing the video is not very clear. If this is a surveillance camera from yes. the 80s. But I'm just wondering if you can at least, if you can kind of get a read on Dale's body language when he opens the door and sees this masked intruder. You're right. You know, if I was in that situation, I think the video would show me, like, open the door and then shut it right away because there's a masked man in the doorway, and I know that's not right. Or, you know, if I'm a security guard, I might try to hold him off to some extent. So does he just... Let, like just chat with this guy and then just open the door, hold it open for him and let him come in. Um, like that's what I'm curious about. I can tell you exactly the information that I have because you're right. Okay. The, the, the tapes are incredibly, I can, you know what I'm going to do, Elaine, I'm going to pull up. So I'll show you exactly what it says, but then I'm going to pull up the part from unsolved mysteries where it shows a reenactment of it because okay. because the um her, his daughter said she saw the actual tape and that the reenactment okay. from unsolved mysteries is spot on okay Ooh. okay so that's good. the best we're gonna get because there's a still from the actual tape and it's it's so bad it's mm. so difficult to make anything out i mean but they are available and i'll post them on our website for people to check them out if they want. Um, awesome. But basically, this is exactly what it said, and this is from the Unsolved Mysteries fandom website, okay? Okay. The investigation next focused on three security... This is after the dog, right? The investigation next focused on three security cameras that monitor the plant around the clock. Four days after Dale vanished, personnel manager Patrick Foley viewed the footage from them. He was surprised and disturbed by what they had recorded. The first thing he saw was a masked intruder walking into the guards area in the back of the plant at around 10.40 p.m., 10 minutes after Dale relieved Art. When Foley saw the intruder on tape, he was very alarmed. He assumed that Dale had been the victim of foul play and was abducted by this person. Then at at 10.45 p.m., which is five minutes later, The footage showed Dale coming in and meeting the intruder in the corridor in the back of the plant. The two appeared to briefly talk to each other. It also showed the two walking together in the plant. Dale was not seen again after that. About a minute later, the intruder was seen walking alone. Foley was unsure what to think about the situation. As Foley continued to review the tapes, he saw the intruder go up and into the tank area at around midnight. The intruder then began removing the platinum pipe from the tank. At that point, he realized that not only did they have a missing, then it goes on to say the the platinum was stolen and et cetera. But that's the description that they have. So do you want to watch the Unsolved Mysteries segment for a few minutes or no? Okay. Yeah, let's do it. We can get your reaction to that. All right, so my first thought they showed some pictures of him in this video and he looks like a very unassuming man. Yeah. He doesn't look very manipulative. Those are just my first impressions. <laughs> he doesn't very. look manipulative. Okay. <laughs> he just seems unassuming and nice and it's like your, your standard dad figure who's just trying to work a job and yeah. get some money to retire. That's um, the vibe I got too. That video was very interesting. I definitely thought it looked like he was being coerced in it. So as the intruder, as they're walking into the frame, he is, Dale's standing in the front, and this intruder is standing behind him. And during the whole length of their walking together, you can't see the intruder's right arm because it's behind Dale's back, which Mm -hmm. makes me think that he's got a weapon of some kind. You know, he could easily have a gun pressed into his back, which is 
causing him, which is prompting him to, to take him to wherever he wants to go. I'm definitely leaning toward Dale not being an accomplice. I think that he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know what, Elaine? I thought the same thing when I saw the video. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I agree. Like, I noticed that, too. They seemed very close when they were walking together. Like, Mm -hmm. too close than two people would normally walk, in my opinion. Yeah. So, it's almost looking like, you know, it's possible. It showed in in the clip. It's possible that he saw this guy somehow, and he went to investigate and maybe the guy, you know, n- knowing there's surveillance cameras was said something to him, like, act normal. Don't make mm-hmm. a scene. I will sh- yeah. I'll kill you. I'll kill you if you don't listen to what I'm saying. And then maybe, like, show me where your, tell me where your glass plant is. But the, he's never, he's never seen at the, uh, the glass kiln thing. So did he just say, like, tell me how to get up there? Yeah, I fear that Dale was killed, but I don't know where his body is or ended up or how he was killed without any blood being found in the plant. You know, I mean, could he he have been shot unconscious? Well, if he was shot, shot, there'd be blood, wouldn't there? Somewhere. (sighs) Unless he was knocked unconscious taken out of the building and then dealt with at a later time. But I wonder if this guy came in, he had either done his research in some capacity or worked at another similar plant or something. So he knew what to do once he got there, but maybe he just, he was telling Dale, like, tell me where the kiln is so I know where to go. Once he got that information. He killed him. Yeah. Yeah, because then yeah. Dale would have been Dale would have been a witness. Yeah. I wonder if this guy thought he was going to be able to do it without Dale noticing or if he always intended if he always knew he would he was going to have to kill the security guard. Well, what do you make of the fact this happened like basically right after Dale came to work? This did this person know there was a shift change? This person had to have known there was a shift change, but did he know, did he know that there was going to be another person coming in or did he think the security guard just left at 1030 and then there was no security guard? Oh, yeah. I don't know. It's a really, it's a really baffling or it's, it's a really compelling story because I could see on one hand where he could have done it. I'll give, let me give you this. There was another unsolved mystery segment I saw that I almost was going to talk about on this episode, but it was actually solved. Oh. But it was, it was similar in the sense that there was a woman whose job it was, and I'll, I'll update, you know, if I can remember the name, but anyway, it was this woman and her job was to drive around and like rip, like fill different ATMs with cash. That was her oh. job. Okay. And I think you could probably know where this is going. She was told at her job, like that she was going to be switching roles and that they were going to have her train somebody else to do what she does. So oh. they made... And she was going to be doing some other job for the bank or something. She wasn't losing okay. her job, but they were pulled. Some, I forget the exact circumstances. Anyway, so they made arrangements for her to train this person like later in the day. But mm-hmm. she did not listen to what they said. And she went on her route anyway. Long story short, she vanished. And like hundreds of thousands of dollars were gone as well. But none, oh. of, none of the footage... Show all the footage showed her alone, but there were some areas off camera where it's potential that an intruder was there. I think there was actually one, um, like surveillance clip of her with someone else, 
anyway, long story short, her family swore up and down. She would never do anything like this. Like there's, there's no way she would run off and not talk to us. It turns out they caught her and she had done just that. She had stolen the money. Wow. So my whole point in reiterating that is just to say these, these families, you know, you think they, you never want to think that your loved one would do something like that. Right. But it's possible. I, I guess anyone is capable of that. It's just, it does seem weird though, to leave behind six kids with no contact with them. I agree. And Thirty to forty thousand dollars in debt is not even that much to commit a crime of this capacity. Well, if he was going to do it, he would have to disappear, right? Because, well, well yeah, the statute of limitations. His son was saying in seven years was going to be up. So, and that's pl- like way more than that has passed since this happened. Right. So yeah, but I agree. It, it seems like. It seems like he was interrupted. And that missing hour, I don't know what to do with that either. When he's seen talking to the person, if he is being coerced, I guess it would have taken that long for maybe him to kill Dale. Like between 11 and midnight when he's seen up at the the plant. Uh, real quick, I did Google how accurate are dogs at following a scent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, search dogs found and correctly identified the target sent 91% of the time. Oh, wow. That's impressive. That's pretty accurate. But I still don't so, understand why his scent was on the, like, by the, the tank if it wasn't on his normal rounds. And they see the masked intruder up there. Yes. So my first thought when you talked about the tank the first thing I jumped to was, could the intruder have put Dale's body in the tank? Um, if this is a scenario where there's like molten glass, I feel like that would pretty well destroy a body. But I don't know that if it was on or how big this tank is or anything like that. Yeah, I feel like if that were to be the case, there would be some sort of evidence left behind i mean i actually don't know so if anybody does know i would love to hear from you because Mm -hmm. uh, yeah i'm just not familiar i'm sure it it could do a lot of damage but would i mean would there be any sort of i don't know i would like for you to rank these in order of likelihood in your mind okay this was Dale was innocent and he was coerced into this, killed and then removed from the site by an intruder. Mm-hmm. Two, that Dale was in on this with someone mm-hmm. and they both somehow escaped unharmed, and that Dale is alive somewhere enjoying the fortune. Mm-hmm. Three, they were in on it, but one man killed the other in a last minute display of greed. Uh Uh-huh. Like one of them used the other to get into the plant and do this. And then they turned on one another. Yes. Or is Uh, there's a fourth theory? I don't know, but those three, what do you, what are you in your mind? What do you think is most likely? I think most likely Dale is innocent. And he was a victim in this crime. I think second, most likely second, most likely, I think they could have been accomplices and one killed the other. I'm with you. I don't think he's alive for sure. Especially now he would be in his eighties. I mean, I think he was, I think he was killed probably Mm -hmm. sadly. Yeah. I mean, that does open up a whole new question of, where is his body? Well, I want to know. I have a question. So they say like the car, like the, the keys being in the ignition and all the stuff left in his truck. That's a sign yes. that he was like, I don't get how his stuff was found in the plant, like his lunch and all that. Mm-hmm. I mean, wouldn't he have taken his, it's almost like 
for his keys to be in the ignition, he would have had to be interrupted while he was driving or arriving there, right? But he's seen inside the plant talking to this guy and his lunch and stuff is in there. So yeah, yeah. If it was, if I don't understand the keys in the ignition, you know what I'm saying? Right. So he either, he, willingly, he either willingly left the keys in the ignition when he got out of his truck at 1030 and that's just where he kept them. Or there had to have been a scenario where he tried to escape the plant to leave, put the keys in the ignition. The intruder caught up with him and got him out of the vehicle um, and mm. dealt with him after that. But I don't see how that could have happened without any security cameras picking up anything. Yeah, that's, I don't, that's, and it's unclear to me exactly where these cameras are and what they show. It's just, right. but if they were able to see the guy walking alone and then Dale wasn't found anywhere on the premises, right. I don't know. But yeah, Elaine, that's the, um, that's the story of Dale Kerstetter. And yeah. was oh, he a one, victim or a criminal? Good. Yeah, it is. It's a good story. And I, I do feel bad because if I have to guess what happened here, I think I would agree with you. I think he was a victim based on the fact that one, he's the body language to me. If, if it's as accurate as his daughter says, it's pretty much exactly like it happened. Yeah. The body language to me does not suggest he'd have to be a really good actor to pull off that he was, you know what I'm saying? Being coerced. Right. Cause uh, yeah. so I think, yeah, I think the first scenario is most likely that he saw this guy confronted him and the guy said something like, don't, don't make any moves. Don't act weird or I'll kill you. And he had a gun. Mm -hmm. Yep. And because I do think with all of his kids, it sounds like he was a loving father. Mm hmm. I know there's been circumstances where, where the father or the mother or whoever does commit a completely shocking crime that no one expects, but I feel like that's pretty rare. Yeah, and another thing is he was he had worked there for 27 years and he could retire soon if he wanted to. Why? Yeah. Did, so why would he do this? And like his daughter said, he had he had savings, he had stock. I mean. Mm -hmm. I could see where some people may think he could have done it, but I think I'm leaning more towards that he did not. Yeah. I agree with you. I definitely jumped back and forth throughout the description of this case, but I'm feeling too. Too confident now. <laughs> me too. Yeah. Yeah. He just, he seems innocent to me. Yeah. You just get that vibe. Hopefully, if he's not with us anymore, he can rest in peace and that his story will be told. It's, it's an interesting one. In 1990, his daughter petitioned the Pennsylvania Superior Court to have him declared legally dead. So this would have oh. been three years after the incident took place. The, some attorney for the place he worked, the Corning, they argued against it because they... For some reason, his employers seem to think he did this. I don't know why they're so adamant on that. Corning ref refused to turn over any of his pension or insurance money to his children. What? And so... This company kind of sucks. I mean, seriously. And they're not very nice about him. He could be dead, and they're sitting here being like, yeah, he was all right. You know, he was slow. <laughs> um, yeah. But... So the saga continues. They actually ruled against his daughter. And they said there was no evidence that he was met with foul play. Hmm. And then I guess seven years had not elapsed following his dis disappearance. I don't know if that's a requirement or whatever. Yeah. Um, but in July 2014, which Jesus is 14 years after she originally asked for it, he was finally declared legally dead and they declared his wow. date of death as the day of his disappearance and the huh. company the company was ordered to pay 27 years worth of interest on his pension as good. well as interest on his life insurance proceeds well good 
So since then, they have uh, investigated several leads, um, including the possibility that he was, quote, double-crossed and killed by a former coworker who helped him steal it. Another lead, he was placed in a gas well near the plant. He was placed in the plant's furnace. He was killed in a mob-related incident. These are all like theories, but none of these theories have been confirmed. They're all rumors. Okay. Um, the furnace wasn't even on the night, so it could not have been used to s dispose of the body, they've said. Okay. And in 1994, Dale's mother sadly passed away without ever finding out the outcome. But that's, that's all I have for this. That's pretty much all the info. I guess if Dale did do it and is out there alive, this was a pretty significant heist. So I'll go as far to him. say I'll go as far to say he's a pretty he's a badass at this because yeah. I mean if he did do it he didn't kill anyone I mean he didn't right. he may have hurt the Probably. company but I mean I'm so, sure they were a multi million dollar company anyway I have trouble feeling bad for companies who make that kind of money <laughs> I hope none of my listeners hate me for this for saying that but. I like him. He seems like a likable. He was a likable person. He does seem likable. Yeah. Not that I know anything about him other than he just, the vibe I get was he was just trying to make a, trying to make his money. And he was, you know, like you said, kind of a dad figure, just trying to live his life. And if you post a picture of him on the blog, people will see, or on the, on your website, people will see. He looks just like a really nice, unassuming kind of man. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening to episode 26 of 1 Minute and 43 Seconds. What are we? A true Unsolved Mysteries podcast. Don't forget to check out the website for source information, 143mysteries.com. You can also follow me on Instagram at 143mysteries. And we have a Twitter account now, so I highly, highly suggest you go follow me on Twitter. I'm on Twitter at one. Four, three podcast. See you on social media and we'll see you for the next episode. I promise you won't have to wait as long as you did this past couple months. Mm -hmm. And thank you again to Elaine for being a guest. Thank you for having me. Hope to see you again. Take care and cheers to Dale. One minute and 43 seconds is dedicated to my number one fan. Thanks, Dad. I love you and I miss you. This podcast has been approved by Skipper the Cat. Right, Skippy?